Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. Today we're going to review the latest Retroid device. This is the Pocket 2S. Now, this is marketed as being an entry or budget level device, and I do agree with that assessment. In fact, what we're getting here in terms of power for the price is one of the best I've ever seen. And if you're just now getting started into handheld emulation systems and you want something that runs on Android, then I think you cannot go wrong with the Pocket 2S. However, there are other options on the market, and we'll discuss that as well in this video here. Mainly, I want to focus on the differences between this one and the other products that Retroid has released, as well as the competition, and then we'll also help you decide if this one in particular is going to be the best fit for you. And so, without any further delay, let's go ahead and dive right in. Okay, let's go ahead and get started with the specs. For the CPU, we have the Unisoc T610, and this is very similar to the T618 chipset that we've seen on other devices like the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus. For RAM, we have two different options, either 3 or 4 gigabytes, and same thing with internal storage, either 32 gigs or 128. And bear in mind, this does have a micro SD card slot, so you can expand your storage that way as well. The display is a pretty standard 3.5 inches with a resolution of 640x480, that is a 4x3 aspect ratio. The battery is 4000 milliamp hours, which I found gives me between 4 and 6 hours of battery life on average. Also of note, when putting it in standby or sleep mode, it loses about 2% battery overnight. For connectivity, we have 2.4 and 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi, and it runs Bluetooth 5.0. This means you'll be able to use it for external controllers or Bluetooth audio. The operating system is running Android 11 with a special build made by Retroid. And finally, additional features include a micro HDMI port if you want to plug this into an external monitor, and then also a 3.5mm headphone jack. Now, Retroid is marketing this as a $99 handheld. And while that is technically correct, let's go ahead and go over the price and what to expect. Number one, like I mentioned, there are two different RAM and storage options. And you can definitely get by with just three gigs of RAM and 32 gigs of storage, but I do think you will have a better experience with the upgraded version. That additional gig of RAM will make the overall Android experience just feel a little bit snappier. And it'll also make a difference when it comes to playing Android games, which usually do require a fair amount of RAM. But bear in mind, it will come with an additional cost. It's going to be $119 if you want to get the upgraded version. And of note, we have six different color options available right now, and there is also a metal version coming in the future. And that one will likely cost even more. Now, the other thing to factor when buying from Retroid is you have to pay for shipping and maybe applicable taxes. I'm just going to pick a random location right here for our shipping test. We're going to use the Seahawks Stadium. I don't want to use where I live as an example here in Hawaii just because shipping is a lot more. Either way, as you can see to the mainland US, the minimum price here for shipping is going to be an additional $15. And depending on where you live, the shipping might be more or you may have some import duties and taxes. So the way I see it, I'm personally not comfortable calling this a $99 handheld, but it's definitely under $150 when all is said and done. So that's the context I'm going to go with when it comes to considering the overall price of the Retroid Pocket 2S. So let's go ahead and get started with the unboxing portion. Now this is a review unit sent to me from Retroid directly. All opinions are my own and no money was exchanged in any way, and they're not seeing this review ahead of time. Inside I have a screen protector, I think this is only coming with early pre-order units, and there's also a card which will explain the full specs of the device. And below that there's not really much else going on, we just have a single USB-C charging cable. So let's go ahead and jump into the device, and there's a few things that struck me initially about it, so let's talk about those gut reactions right here at the beginning. Now the first thing that struck me about this device is that it feels a lot thinner than I was expecting. And sure enough, here it is, just a little bit more than 16 millimeters at its thinnest point. And it turns out that is thinner than the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. In fact, it's about the same thinness as the Ambernic RG405M. However, the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus is still much thinner at its thinnest point. Now, another factor to consider is its thickest point. So this is going to include the triggers as well as the thickness of the D-pad. And again, that is quite a bit thinner than the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus at its thickest. However, the 2S is still thicker overall than the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, and same thing with the RG405M, which does not have protruding triggers. So yeah, that was the first thing that impressed me about the 2S, is that it is relatively thin. In addition, it feels more lightweight than I was expecting too. You can see here it's a little bit less than 200 grams, which is about the same as the original Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. And that does make it significantly lighter than other similar handhelds on the market like the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, the Ambernic RG405M, and the Retroid Pocket Flip. So overall, I think it is a thin and a lightweight handheld. It's also relatively small, so pretty easy just to kind of grab and carry around with you. The overall size of it definitely reminds me of like an old school gaming handheld. 
felt. However, I did find that it was less pocketable than I would like, and a lot of that has to do with the protruding trigger buttons on the back. They just kind of stick out in my pocket like this, and it just feels a little bit awkward. In addition, I found that it would also get stuck on my pocket when pulling it out, both from the triggers as well as the analog sticks. So maybe not the most ideal device that I would use to throw in my pocket and walk around. And it is a similar story if you were to try to use your back pocket. It just kind of protrudes a little more than I would like. So definitely a small and lightweight handheld, but something I would be more apt to throw in a backpack or a bag than actually putting in my pocket. Okay, and the third impression that I had when first picking up the device was just how slippery the plastic felt overall. Especially here on the back, there's no writing or other texture to just make it easier to grip. And I think if you were to buy one of the models that were a darker color, you probably would start to see some smudging. Thankfully, with the lighter 16-bit color one that I have here, it doesn't really show up. Now, there's a couple transparent models, and those might actually have a little bit more texture. To use the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus as an example, I do have a transparent version of this one, and you can see it does have a nice grippy texture to it. I also have a transparent Retroid Pocket Flip that has a nice texture too, but not quite as grippy as the 3 Plus. Either way, yes, this is another thing that caught my eye, is just the fact that this feels a little bit more cheap and slippery than I was hoping. But other than that, I really like the design here. It just has a very classic retro handheld feel to it. It almost feels like something that could have been made by Nintendo, but just not quite. Now let's go ahead and talk about the controls, and I want to focus on the new items first. And I think probably most importantly are these analog sticks. Number one, this is a completely new design, and it's using Hall Effect sensors, which means it has a magnetic connection and no stick drift. In addition, I really like the caps they're using on the thumbsticks here. They have a concave shape to them. They remind me of something like an Xbox controller. And they also have a soft, rubbery feel to them. In terms of range and smoothness, I think they are very excellent too. They're certainly small analog sticks, but I feel like I have a large amount of control considering their size. And I think they're miles better than the typical ones that you would find that look like they came from a Nintendo Switch Joy-Con. Doing a quick teardown right here, let's take a look at the overall housing. So yes, this is a completely new design right here. You will not be able to drop in and replace this on other handhelds that have already released. But I think it's a really nice solid housing too. I'm really impressed by this overall design. Long story short, I'm a big fan of these sticks and I hope they become a standard in future handhelds. While we're here, let's go ahead and take a quick look at the inside of the device. And you can see it has a very clean and professional design. In particular, you can see the left side controls are modularized. That's going to be really handy if you need to swap out the buttons in the future. And the battery is far away from the CPU, which means you're not going to have any issues with overheating or a potential exploded battery. Okay, let's move over to the D-pad. This is one we've seen on other devices. Both the Retro Pocket 3 and the 3 Plus had a similar design. These use a dome style connection, similar to what you would find in a Nintendo Switch Joy-Con, and they're also very reminiscent of the PS Vita. This one has a bit of a loose feel to it, but also still very tactile and responsive. The way I like to describe a D-pad like this is that it feels very accurate. So let's do some quick testing. We're going to start with the Contra test. This is where I push down on the D-pad and then rock it left and right. And ideally, the character would not move, and as you can see right here, it is locked in. And so in terms of very precise movement with a platformer, this is going to work out really well. In addition, when actually just playing the game, it's still very easy to press a diagonal. The other test I like to do is with Capcom style fighting games. And I found that this one works pretty well, although Hadoukens are easier to pull off than Shoryukens. And I would say I had maybe a 75% success rate with the Dragon Punches. Either way, I do think it is a good D-pad. Next up, we'll talk about the start and select buttons, and I'm happy to report that they are not on the top of the device like on the 3 and 3 Plus. These have a hard clickiness to them, like a micro switch connection. In addition, they are relatively flush with the case, and so it is one of those things where you kind of have to reach and really know where you're pressing to press down on them. Personally, I would have liked if they had a soft dome switch connection and they were a little bit more prominent on the case. And it's the same thing with the Android function buttons here on the bottom. They're just kind of flush and harder to press down on. We also have front-facing stereo speakers. We'll talk more about them when we do a sound test. But next up, I want to talk about the face buttons. Now, these are using a rubber membrane connection. That's going to be very similar to classic controllers like on the Nintendo and Super Nintendo from back in the day. And this will definitely give you an old school kind of mushy feel, but they are still nice and responsive. The buttons themselves are relatively small like they are on most other handhelds. It's about seven and a half millimeters. So just a little bit bigger than what you would find on a Nintendo Switch Joy-Con. I think overall these are good buttons, but my only complaint here is that they don't feel like a very good match with that soft dome connection on the D-pad. Ideally, I would like to have the same style feel on either side. And this is something they got right with the original Retroid Pocket 3, which had dome style buttons as well as a D-pad. However, with the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, they switched it back over to a 
membrane style button and I really wasn't a fan of that change. And unfortunately they've gone forward with that same change here with the 2S. And I think this can probably be categorized as a nitpick right here and a very personal preference, but all the same, I do wish that these two control schemes matched up. Okay, moving on, let's check out the shoulder and trigger buttons. The shoulder buttons themselves have a nice soft clickiness to them. They're very easy to press down on. And I think they're a good size, and so no complaints here overall. Moving over to the triggers, I'm happy to see here that they're using analog style inputs. This means that as you're pressing it down, those nuances of anywhere between 0 and 100 are going to get registered. And this is great because certain emulated systems like Sega Saturn, Dreamcast, and GameCube did use analog inputs. And in terms of overall feel, I think it's pretty good. It's a little bit cheap feeling, but again, we're looking at a budget device. And I think the overall travel and range is just about perfect. I really don't have any complaints about these triggers at all. And it makes a world of difference when playing certain games. In addition to the emulated systems I mentioned before, when you're doing game streaming, this will come in handy as well. Especially when it comes to streaming a racing game like Forza Horizon 5. The combination here of that hall sensor analog stick, which is super accurate, but then also those analog triggers just really feels good. It almost feels like the precise controls that we have here doesn't really belong on a device so cheap. And so I think that's a major win for the Retroid Pocket 2S. Now let's talk a little bit about the I.O. starting with the top. We have a micro HDMI port as well as a USB-C port for both charging and connectivity. To the right of that we have our volume buttons and then our power and sleep button. And while we're at it, let's check out that HDMI functionality. Now I'm using an adapter here to be able to plug it into my monitor. And you can pick these up very cheap on Amazon for about 10 bucks or less. And the whole connectivity thing is super easy. You just plug it in and it'll immediately know what you're plugging into. It'll turn off the screen on the device and you can start playing right then and there. The output of your video signal will be a 720p resolution, so it's not going to be super high. And I also noticed that it's using a kind of weird aspect ratio. It's not a full 16 by 9, and it's definitely not a 4 by 3, as you can see here with the NES, which just looks a little bit squished. So I'm not sure what this exact aspect ratio is, but if I was just to eyeball it, I would say it's probably a 3 by 2 or maybe a 16 by 10. And that is going to carry over to 16 by 9 content as well. So when playing PSP like this, you can see there are black bars on the left and right. However, if you're just looking for a quick way to be able to play on a larger screen and you don't want to be bothered by aspect ratio, most of these games are going to look fine. In particular, I've always found that Sega Saturn looks pretty good at a 3 by 2 aspect ratio, so right here it actually feels pretty nice. But there are some tricks you could do. For example, within RetroArch here with Super Nintendo, I changed the aspect ratio to 8 by 7. That made the black bars on the left and right a little bit bigger and closer to a 4x3. And another thing to note is that you don't have to just play on the device like this. You could connect it with a Bluetooth controller and have even a multiplayer session. Just bear in mind you will have to go into each of the individual emulators and set that up. And it's not going to be a very easy process. It's not going to be plug and play like on a Nintendo Switch. However, if you did want to take the time and configure all those things within the options, you could totally have a retro gaming party on a larger TV using just the Retroid Pocket 2S. Okay, moving back to the rest of the I.O., let's go ahead and look at the bottom. So here we have our micro SD card slot. This has a hard plastic shell and you will have to kind of go in there and dig it out. But once you have it open, it's pretty easy to throw your card inside and this can take any size card, even up to like a terabyte. And then of course to the right of that we have our headphone jack. Now we've already seen the back, not a lot going on here other than these four Torx screws. And the fit size on these are going to be T5 if you want to open them up yourself. In terms of overall ergonomics, this does feel very good in the hand. It does have a bit of a blocky design to it, but I think it just feels retro in that regard, and so I don't mind it at all. It's definitely a D-pad centric device, so I think retro games are going to feel the most comfortable here, but it's still very good for analog stick style gaming as well. It's not much of a stretch to get to that left analog stick. So when it comes to playing arcade games, I think it's going to be a great fit. And same thing with home console systems that have an analog style control, like most Nintendo 64 games. This one here is also a good example because I have to press down on the left trigger while using the analog stick. And while it is a little bit of a stretch, I wouldn't call this uncomfortable. I could definitely play this game for an extended period like this. Another thing to note is there is an accelerometer inside, so if you want to use any sort of motion controls, it is possible. But I did find that the controls themselves were not very accurate, and so it wasn't something that I really enjoyed using, even if it did support it within a game. Okay, next let's talk about the screen. So first thing you're probably going to notice are those larger bezels here on that 3.5 inch display. I know a lot of people don't like that, but I do think it does give a bit of a nostalgic and retro look. However, there are definitely better options out there if you're looking for a better screen real estate compared to the device. The Ambernic RG405M is probably the shining example right now. This one has a 4 inch display, so it's half an inch bigger, but it also has smaller bezels. And so as you can see here, even though this device is only a little bit larger than the Retroid Pocket 2S, 
brightness. The screen here is impressively large by comparison. Speaking of comparison, let's do a brightness and dimness test. At the max brightness, you can see they're about the same. This is actually a new screen on the 2S that can go up to 450 nits. And it does get plenty bright, probably not something you'd want to play outdoors all the time, but still pretty good. In terms of dimness, I found that this was okay, but not excellent. You can see here that the RG405M does get quite a bit dimmer. So if I had to choose only one of these two devices to use in a pitch black environment, I would definitely not pick the RP2S. But I think it'll be just fine in a lower light condition. Now, one drawback that happens with any 4x3 aspect ratio device is that it's not going to be great when it comes to playing widescreen content. For example, here in a comparison with the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, you can see that Horizon Chase in the 16x9 format just gives you a lot more to see. And that's going to be the same across the board when it comes to playing anything at this aspect ratio. In fact, playing 16x9 content on this device does get a little bit squinty. And it's kind of a shame because, for example, PlayStation Portable plays flawlessly on this device even at a 2x resolution. However, the letterboxing here does make the screen just look relatively small. In fact, this is quite a bit smaller than the original PSP screen, so even though it is an upgrade in terms of resolution, it does feel a bit like a downgrade too. But of course, the pendulum swings both ways, so if we take a widescreen device like the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, even though this one has a 4.7 inch screen, when it comes to displaying 4x3 content, there's not a big difference here. The RP2S obviously has 3.5 inches of 4x3 content, but as you can see, the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus only gives you 3.8. So in general, when it comes to playing 4x3 games, I'd rather play on the 2S than on the 3 Plus. And thankfully, most of the emulated systems that run well on the Retroid Pocket 2S are in 4x3. One last note, this is a touchscreen, and I would say the responsiveness here is pretty good. You can definitely get by with some rudimentary controls with touchscreen-based games like Nintendo DS or 3DS. And when it comes to typing in like a username and password, it is serviceable, but not super great. After all, it is a relatively low resolution screen. Next up, let's do an audio test. This is at 100% volume. I think the sound quality here is actually very good. It is crisp and clear, maybe not as bassy as I would like, but still very good for this price point. In fact, I would say the audio is better than its competitors. Let's go ahead and do a comparison test now. So I think the Retroid Pocket 2S has a couple things going for it. Number one, these are front firing speakers, so the audio is going to go directly into your ears. But overall, I think the quality here is excellent too. It makes the others sound muffled by comparison. Okay, and the last comparison I want to do is just to give you a feel of the overall size of the Retroid Pocket 2S. So I'm just going to throw a bunch of handhelds up on the screen and you can see what they look like in comparison. We'll start with other 3.5 inch display devices. The Retroid Pocket 2 Plus, as you can see right here, is basically a dead ringer in terms of overall size. The Ambernick RG353P series is a little bit larger, but with the same size screen. But the Ambernick RG353M is a little bit smaller and more compact, but is also quite a bit more expensive. We've already looked at the Ambernick RG405M, but here is another comparison. And also, let's take another look at the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus. The Retroid Pocket Flip is kind of cheating because it's a clamshell so it can get pretty compact. So let's move on. Here is the PlayStation Vita. This has a 5-inch screen. Same thing with the Ambernick RG505. In fact, this does have a PS Vita OLED screen inside. And the Palkitty RGB 10 Max 3 Pro, yeah, that is a terrible name, also is a 5-inch screen. Next up is the Nintendo Switch Lite. This one here is 5.5 inches. And same size here with the Palkitty X55. Moving on to 6 inches, this is the AYN Odin Lite. Fun fact here is this screen is about the size of the overall Retroid Pocket 2S. And finally, because why not, here is a comparison against a 7-inch screen on the Steam Deck. Okay, next I want to talk about the software experience and just what it's like to use the Retroid Pocket 2S day in and day out. When you first start it up, it'll walk you through the initial setup process. And this is the same setup process that we've seen for years now. The original Retroid Pocket 2 Plus had something very similar. Here you're going to set up things like your Wi-Fi and your time zone. And they also give you the option to pre-install a bunch of apps. Personally, I don't recommend installing them. I think you should do it yourself. 
And I have guides for both the Retroid Pocket devices and Android in particular and which apps I recommend. You also have the ability to use the built-in Retroid front end or just a regular Android launcher. And again, for me personally, I like to use the Android one and then set up a launcher myself. So what I'll do is I'll leave a bunch of links down below for my guides in case you do need to set this up. And when it comes to front ends, I currently recommend this one here called Daijisho. This one is free and very customizable. And of course, as you can imagine, I've already got a guide for this, but you're probably getting a pretty good feel of what this experience is gonna be like. You can tab between your different platforms, and then when you open up each platform, you'll get a listing of your games. Now the Retroid Pocket 2S doesn't come with any games preloaded at all, so you're gonna be on your own to set all of this up. But once you get the hang of it, it is pretty easy. It's just a matter of putting your games on a card, putting them in the device, and then setting up the emulator to run the game, and then using Daijisho as the front end to just kind of wrap it all together. One thing of note here is that the L2 and R2 buttons are not picked up by Daijisho. And so unfortunately you can't use these to tab between the different functions. Instead, I would recommend going into the settings and setting them to L3 and R3 instead. That means all you have to do is just click on the sticks themselves to go to like your apps list or into your settings. Anyway, that's really about it. I don't want to turn this into a guide. We're really just kind of looking at the overall experience. However, one thing I do want to bring up, if you swipe down from the top, you'll be able to see that you can change out different performance profiles. And we have three to choose from, balance, performance, and extreme. I found that with balance, you can play just about any of those classic systems. So all the way up to like Super Nintendo or even PS1, and that'll save on battery life too. I recommend using the performance setting for those middleweight systems, things like Nintendo 64, Dreamcast, Sega Saturn. And then finally, I would recommend using the Extreme setting for Nintendo GameCube, PS2, 3DS, and Nintendo Switch. So with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and talk about the performance expectations for this device. Well, we're going to start with the easy systems and work our way up. We'll start with handheld systems first. As expected, things like Game Boy and Game Boy Color are going to work absolutely fine. These originally had an aspect ratio of 10 by 9, so you'll see a little bit of pillar boxing on the left and right. But overall, I think it's still a great experience to play these classic games on this system. Game Boy Advance also runs really well but is an opposite experience. This one will have letterboxing because originally it was a 3 by 2 aspect ratio. Either way, I think that Game Boy Advance games will look and play absolutely perfect right here. Moving over to Nintendo DS, I would recommend using games that don't require you to see both screens at once. What I generally will do is map the screen swapping to my L3 and R3 buttons. That way I can tap between them if I do need to see one screen at a time. And because the original DS screens were 4 by 3 aspect ratio, they're going to fill up the whole screen on the 2S. And of course, because it is a touch screen, if you do need to touch anything, that is going to be available to you as well. And it's a similar setup with Nintendo 3DS. I did find that the Citra MMJ build worked better than the official one on the Android store. And the performance here is just about the same as it was on T618 devices like the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus. I'd say that you can expect to play most lightweight and 2D 3DS games with no problem. In fact, some 3D-based games still work pretty well. For example, Ocarina of Time was actually running at full speed. In my testing, I put a couple hours into this game and got pretty far, and there were some slowdowns here and there, but all the same, I would say it was perfectly playable. In fact, I'm thinking about finishing up the entire game on my Retroid Pocket 2S. However, it's not a perfect system, and so there are going to be a lot of games that aren't going to play at full speed. Mario Kart 7 is probably the first example that I ran into. So again, I would stick to mostly 2D and lightweight games, and you'll probably be pleasant surprised at how many 3DS games will run at a very good speed. And I also tested out arcade games, I found that these played great, so any of your 80s and 90s classics will probably play at full speed. And like I mentioned before, this analog stick feels really good as a joystick replacement. Moving over to classic home consoles, as expected, the 8-bit systems like the NES work absolutely fine. Now this is a relatively low resolution screen at 480p, so you'll have to use shaders if you want balanced pixels. So for example here with NES I'm using the Sharp Bilinear 2x Prescale shader. It's going to be a similar story with Super Nintendo, I would recommend using a shader. In this example I'm using Pixelate, which is a little bit sharper, but I still think really gets the point across. So yes, overall when it comes to playing 8-bit and 16-bit systems, you'll have absolutely no problem here. The Retroid Pocket 2S has plenty of headroom for these systems. Now as we start moving up, I want to talk a little bit about benchmarks and what kind of performance you can expect going forward. I'm not a huge fan of benchmark testing, but all the same, I think that the data here will give us an idea of the difference between the 2S and the T618 devices. So to start, I did the 3D Mark Wildlife test. You can see I got a score of 440 on the Retroid Pocket 2S when running in the extreme mode. And there's a huge difference here between this and the T618 devices, which got an average of 723 or 724. And so even though the T610 and T 
share the same cores, the higher clock speeds on the T618 really do make a difference when it comes to GPU-reliant tests like this 3D Mark one. However, when it comes to emulation, a CPU-based test is going to be better. And as you can see here, the Geekbench 6 scores between these two are very similar. And that's a great sign for the Retroid Pocket 2S, because for most cases of emulation, it's the CPU that matters the most. And so in a nutshell, when looking at these scores, you can see that the CPU difference is not that much. And it turns out that the emulation difference is not that much between the two either. So let's go ahead and move on to those more heavyweight systems and see how the 2S will perform. We're going to start with PlayStation 1. This one is running at a 2X resolution, which is just a little bit shy of 480p, depending on the game you're playing. And these are all running great. In fact, you could upscale the resolution to a 3x and it would still run at full speed if you really wanted to make sure that you were getting every pixel on the screen possible. I would also say that Sega Saturn is playable, but you do have to make some specific concessions. Number one, you're going to have to use the Yabasan Shiro standalone emulator, which unfortunately is not quite as accurate as the Beetle core within Retroarch. In addition, depending on the game that you're playing, it will do some auto frame skip using Yabasan Shiro standalone. So I would say this is not perfect Sega Saturn emulation because it's not 100% accurate and you also will get some frame skip here and there. But every game that I tried ran very well and super smooth. And so for me, I would still say that Sega Saturn is completely playable on the Retroid Pocket 2S. Moving over to Nintendo 64, this one was also perfectly playable. I'm using the Mupin 64 Plus FZ Pro standalone emulator, and I'm running everything at a 480p resolution. And every single game I threw at it played at a full speed, so absolutely no problem right here. You're going to have a great time if you want to play Nintendo 64 on this device. And the best thing is, is you don't have to fiddle with any of the settings. This is all just coming out of the box. Next up we have Sega Dreamcast. Even though this is one generation later than the Sega Saturn, it actually still runs easier than that one. And I'm using the Redream emulator set at a 480p resolution. And again, every single game here played at full speed. No need to change any sort of settings or anything else like that. The benchmark game I use to make sure that all Dreamcast games are going to play at full speed is NBA 2K2. And as you can see right here, it's playing smooth as butter. And like I mentioned before, because we have analog triggers, there are many games that are going to take advantage of that control style. In particular, racing games on the Dreamcast play really well thanks to the ability to be able to use the throttle with the right and left triggers. Okay, next up we have PlayStation Portable. When it comes to performance, this one is actually very good as well. Every single game that I tried at a 2x resolution, which is the max resolution you'll be able to get on the screen anyway, they all played at full speed. But unfortunately, like I mentioned before, the major thing stopping me from enjoying the PlayStation Portable as much as I could is the small screen. Not only is the three and a half inch screen just starting to feel relatively small compared to other handhelds on the market, but it feels even smaller when trying to play something that was originally in a 16 by nine aspect ratio. So it's just kind of a bummer that these games play really well in terms of performance, but they're just not that great to look at. Okay, and moving on, let's go to the systems that will not play at 100% speed. We're going to start with Nintendo GameCube. I found that my best overall experience was using the development build of the official Dolphin that you can find on their website. And this one is updated about once a day, so I'm definitely using the latest and greatest. I also tend to turn on the VBI skip hack within the graphics settings. This will reduce audio stuttering, but it won't prevent slowdown, so the games will still get a little bit slow, but they just won't sound as crackly and bad. In general, I use the Vulkan backend, and for all of these ROMs that I'm testing, I use the PAL version. That means that full speed for these games is 50 frames per second instead of 60, so it's going to be easier to reach. And I found that a fair amount of games played at a playable speed, I would say maybe half or a little bit less. It's really going to come down to whether or not you can tolerate a little bit of slowdown here and there, and how much patience you have to go through the settings and see what's going to work for each particular game. I think the Legend of Zelda games are great examples. Wind Waker is a game that plays at 30 frames per second, but I often saw it dip down to maybe 25, 26 here and there. And that mostly would happen in later stages of the game and during combat. Now for me, I found it to be perfectly acceptable because I'm just getting a thrill out of playing Wind Waker in the first place. But if you want to make sure you're playing it perfectly, then this may not be a good solution. And it's a similar experience with Twilight Princess. There will be slowdown here and there, especially when you're in Hyrule Field. But even then, I would be willing to play through this game at this speed. Another standout game is Super Mario Sunshine, particularly the PAL ROM. This one will run at full speed, and it's also just a joy to play, given the fact that we have these nice analog sticks and analog triggers. And that'll come in handy with this game in particular. If you press down on the right trigger just a little bit, you'll be able to squirt and run. But then also if you pull the trigger down all the way, Mario is going to remain stationary so that you can fire with more accuracy. 
Moving over to PlayStation 2, I found that this one performed worse than Nintendo GameCube. There were definitely many games that you could play, but I would say that it was maybe a third of games altogether instead of half. And even then, many of them required some sort of underclocking. So I think if you stick to more lightweight games, things like Kingdom Hearts, Final Fantasy, and Jack and Daxter, yeah, these actually play okay. And it is possible to play some heavyweight games, but you will probably have to fiddle around with the settings. For example, here with God of War, I had to turn it on to a maximum underclock. And it will make the game more jittery under these settings, so it's going to be up to you whether or not you find that acceptable. The way I see it, this device is not built to play GameCube and PS2 games, but they are a nice bonus when you do have a game that plays at full speed. And finally, the last emulated system that I tested was Nintendo Switch. And this is the one system where I found a large performance gap between the T618 devices like the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus. Only the very, very lightweight games, things like Celeste and Sonic Mania, actually played at full speed. Other lightweight games like SteamWorld Dig 2 were not able to manage a full 60 frames per second, and you definitely could feel that slowdown. So in the end, I think there are going to be very few Nintendo Switch games that'll run on the Retroid Pocket 2S. And this has the same problem as PlayStation Portable in the fact that it's originally a 16x9 aspect ratio, which means that everything's going to look pretty small and squinty. Now when it comes to Android gaming, I did test out a few and I found that they play pretty well. And like with other Retroid devices, this does have a built-in key mapper option if you need to use on-screen controls. However, I did find that this was just not a really great fit for Android gaming. Number one, the screen feels really small. After all, these games were developed with a larger screen in mind. And even then, I did get some slowdown here and there with certain games. Even Rocket League Sideswipe didn't play at full speed all the time. So if anything, I would say don't buy this device specifically for Android gaming. And finally, the last test I did was with streaming. And for this example, we're going to use Xbox Game Pass. In terms of controls, I found that everything worked well. The L2 and R2 buttons were mapped correctly. So from a functional standpoint, I had no issues here when it came to streaming onto this device. In addition, the connection was very good. However, I don't think that a 3.5 inch screen with a 4x3 aspect ratio is ideal when streaming modern games. These also are generally going to be in a 16x9 format. And in addition, many of these games were developed with large screen TV in mind. And so even though yes, I can play Halo Reach right here, I did not enjoy myself. It was so hard to be able to see what I was shooting, and so unfortunately it just wasn't a great fit. On the other hand, I had a great time with Forza Horizon 5. That analog trigger is just a lot of fun with the throttle, and the accuracy of the analog sticks is really excellent too. So yes, you can definitely stream on this device, but I would say you're probably going to want to be choosy about which games to play. All right, with all my testing out of the way, let's go ahead and knock out what I like and what I don't like about the Retroid Pocket 2S. As always, we'll start with what I like, and number one is the compact size. It's not advice I would consider to be pocketable, but all the same, I just love grabbing this thing when I have a moment. And because it's nice and small, it is easy to grab and take around with you. I also love these new Hall Sensor analog sticks. I hope they become a standard for future handhelds. Same thing with these analog triggers. They are small, compact, but very responsive. I was also impressed with the emulation power on the RP2S. Even though this is a cheaper and weaker chipset, it still performed toe to toe with the T618 devices. I also think the sound quality here is well above its weight class. And finally, I do like the price here. After paying for shipping and whatever applicable taxes, it's going to be under $150. And it's really impressive to consider the amount of performance that we're getting at that price point, especially when you think about the T618 devices, which are generally more expensive than this one here. Now, of course, the 2S is not perfect, so let's talk about some of the things I don't like. Number one, the 3.5 inch screen just seems really small here in 2023. Now, granted, this has been a standard size for years previously, but there are a lot of other larger screen devices out today. And so in particular, if you don't have the best eyesight, you may want to look into something that has a larger dimension screen. I'm also not a huge fan of the clicky start and select buttons. They are almost flush with the device, so they're kind of hard to find and press down on. And unfortunately, these are buttons that you press fairly regularly, and so it does become quite annoying. Now, the next one I don't think is a particularly bad thing, but it is worth noting. This device does feel cheap. Number one, it's lightweight, so it feels a little bit cheap in the hand. And the texture of the plastic, especially on the back, just doesn't feel super high quality. And in addition, the screen itself has a large bezel. Those three things combined do make the device feel pretty cheap, but then also a little bit retro nostalgic too. So I don't think it's a super bad thing because it's kind of on brand with a cheaper retro device, but there's still part of me that wishes that it had a bit of a more premium feel. And then finally, the last one here is definitely a personal Rust nitpick, but I do wish that they had used face buttons with dome switch connection. And they used to sell dome switch buttons on their website, but unfortunately they took them down, and so there's no way to actually modify this, at least right now. 
And so even though I do think that the current face buttons are just fine, I would prefer if they were dome switch connection. Now, as we wrap up, you're probably wondering whether or not I recommend buying the Retroid Pocket 2S. And I think at face value, yes, I think this device is completely worth it. At this price point, you are getting a lot of value. And honestly, there are no deal breakers with this device either. There are a lot of things that work really well. However, there are a lot of other Android-based devices at this similar price point. So let's talk about your other options and see which one's going to be the best match. So we're going to run through each of these and go over the pros and cons specifically compared to the Retroid Pocket 2S. And we'll start with the previous model that was the same size, the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. This one is cheaper and still has some pretty good performance. It can play most Nintendo 64 and Dreamcast games just fine. However, it does have a weaker chipset, and so things like PSP will definitely not play as well. In addition, this one had a pretty funky control scheme. It had the analog stick up top, and it didn't press down on L3. And then the right analog stick isn't even a stick, it's a slider. And so that one's just kind of weird. In addition, this one's no longer sold by Retroid. You can't go on their website and pick one up. Instead, you'll have to pay a third-party supplier on AliExpress or maybe on Amazon. And depending on where you buy it from, it may not be cheaper than the Retroid Pocket 2S. So I think in all respects, if you don't have any of these devices, I would not recommend the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus over the 2S. I think the 2S fixes many of the issues that we had with the original 2 Plus. However, if you already own a Retroid Pocket 2 or a 2 Plus, then yeah, I think that the 2S might be a worthy upgrade especially if the weaker chipset and the control scheme do throw you off about the 2 Plus. In other words, if you go from the 2 Plus to the 2S, it will feel like an upgrade. Next up, we have the Ambernic RG405M. This one has a lot of things that are better than the 2S. Number one, it has a 4-inch screen with a thinner bezel, and it has that T618 chipset, so it's going to have more power. In addition, this one is slimmer because it doesn't have those stacked shoulder buttons, so it's going to be much easier to pocket. And I also think that the D-pad and face buttons are better on the 405M than they are on the 2S. They each have a rubber membrane connection, but are just really high quality. Speaking of quality, this one also feels very premium. Part of that has to do with the fact that it's using an aluminum shell, and it just feels really nice in the hands. But of course there are some negatives. For example, the RG405M is more expensive and it's also heavier because of that metal shell. And even though it does make it slimmer, those inline triggers are not the best when it comes to playing certain games that require those trigger inputs. In addition, the Android version that comes on the 405M out of the box is not great. So it will require you to flash a custom firmware to optimize the use and performance of this device. So overall, I think that if you were looking for a compact 4x3 aspect ratio device, I personally do prefer the 405M over the Retroid Pocket 2S. But bear in mind, it will come out to about $150 before shipping, so it is more expensive. Speaking of more expensive, let's talk about the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus next. And this one has a lot going for it over the RP2S. Number one is going to be the screen. Not only is it 4.7 inches, but it's a wider aspect ratio, which means it's going to be great for systems like PlayStation Portable. It also uses the T618 chipset, so it's going to be more powerful. And this screen is a higher resolution, which means you can play games at a 720p instead, and they're going to look really good here. But of course, there are some drawbacks here. Number one, it's going to be more expensive, so this starts at about 150 bucks as well. Also, Retroid did a really weird thing where they put these start and select buttons at the very top of the device. That was just kind of odd. But it's no secret that I love my Retroid Pocket 3 Plus. This is my go-to handheld, and it has been for about eight months now. So again, if I had to choose between the 2S and the 3 Plus, I am definitely going to pick the 3 Plus, even if it is more expensive. And of course, that isn't to discount the value of the RP2S. I think they are two different devices for two different people. And it just so happens that the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus is a better fit for me. And finally, the last one I want to do a comparison with is the Retroid Pocket Flip. And this one is very similar to the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus in many respects. It has the same screen and chipset, so everything like the wider aspect ratio and higher resolution is going to apply here. But it has that clamshell form factor that many people love. This one also has some drawbacks compared to the 2S. Number one, it's going to be more expensive as well. In fact, this is more expensive than the 3 Plus. And some of the earlier units did have issues with the hinge cracking. I've heard that they've upgraded the plastic on them, and so it's not so much a problem anymore. But I think it's something to bear in mind if you plan on putting years of wear and tear onto your device. And finally, this one does not have analog sticks, but analog sliders. And while I think the sliders are pretty neat, I think that the new sticks on the 2S are miles better. 
So I think that the Retroid Pocket Flip is still a great device. In fact, this is one that I really enjoy playing. And if I didn't have a Retroid Pocket 3 Plus and maybe the RG405M, this would definitely be my go-to device. And I think if you prefer clamshell devices over others, for example, you just really dig the old Nintendo DS or the 3DS, this might be a great fit here. Just bear in mind that it is quite a bit more expensive than the Retroid Pocket 2S. In fact, it's almost twice as expensive. So in the end, yes, I think there are devices that are better than the Retroid Pocket 2S, but you will be paying for that premium. And that's exactly where the Retroid Pocket 2S really shines, in the fact that it is budget friendly, but also is very good in many respects and just overall is a good handheld. So the way I see it, if you're just now starting out and you want to get a retro handheld, but you don't want to break the bank, then I think that the Retroid Pocket 2S is a very good choice. It has some really excellent controls, in particular those analog sticks and triggers, but then also that native 4x3 aspect ratio is just going to feel really nostalgic and natural for a lot of those retro games that you might be wanting to play. So if you're on the fence about whether or not to spend the money on a retro handheld, I think that the RP2S is a great starting point. However, if you already own a T618 device like the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus or the RG405M, I really don't see the value in picking up the Retroid Pocket 2S. I also think that if you have the Retroid Pocket 2 or the 2 Plus and you're looking for an upgrade in terms of performance and controls, then I think the 2S is going to be a good choice there too. So in the end, I think it's really going to come down to what you already own and what you're in the market to buy. And I think in that regard, the Retroid Pocket 2S is the ideal starter handheld. Number one, it runs on Android, which means it's going to be relatively easy to set up, especially especially if you used an Android tablet or phone before, but also a lot of creature comforts like setting up Wi-Fi and Bluetooth are just a breeze on this device as well. When you combine that with this device, with its excellent controls and sound, and also it doesn't break the bank, I think this is a winning combination. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Are you picking up your first handheld and is this the one to get? Or are you looking to upgrade from something else that you already own? As always, thank you for watching and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.